Welcome to Section 1, Lab Safety. Now, the objective of this course is to familiarize the lab analyst with common lab hazards, to familiarize you with personal protective equipment, also called PPE, and emergency protocols. The reality is that every, and I quite literally mean every lab, has potential hazards. Have you ever sat down and thought about the hazards that you might find in your lab, in your particular situation? Personally, I like classifying them into four categories, temperature hazards, cutting hazards, electrical hazards, and chemical hazards. So take a look at this picture. Can you see potential hazards here? They're actually in plain view. We have a few burning hazards the muffle furnace, and oven. If not treated correctly, could, well, result in a severe burn. We have a handful of cutting hazards as well. Scissors, sharp objects that could be lying around sometimes. We have electrical hazards. Do you see the little wire? Well, the wire may not be insulated correctly. It may not be plugged in correctly. There may be a short. Chemical hazards are pretty much everywhere. I also count biological hazards as chemical hazards in this particular instance. So let's talk a bit about potential burning hazards. Items such as hot plates, hot blocks, ovens, muffle furnaces, and sometimes even instrument components are, well, rather hot to the touch. So be careful when you approach these. If you even suspect that any of these accessories or instruments has been set at any level of temperature, use a thermometer or use an other measurement device to assess whether it's a dangerous level or not. Keep in mind that sometimes evaluating these is quite easy. There may be a temperature gauge up front. Other times you have to be a little more cautious. Instrument components can also be hot. For instance, if you're using a flame atomic absorption spectrometer, well, as the name suggests, there's a flame there. Whatever the flame touches is going to be quite hot for a period of time. Cutting hazards are also quite frequently found in labs, and they can arise from existing and sometimes damaged equipment. For instance, scalpels, blades, spatulas, pipette tips, glass pipettes, needles, Broken glassware are all examples of potential cutting hazards. These are also sometimes called piercing hazards. Now, the reality is using appropriate gloves can significantly reduce the chance of receiving a cut or piercing type injury. I'm not saying this will always protect you. It depends on the kind of glove you're using, but at the very least, it should offer some protection. Please keep in mind that broken glassware, needles, and equivalent items should be disp disposed of in an appropriate sharps container. Please don't throw them into regular trash. That's not where the designer go. Electrical hazards are generally caused by damaged or incorrectly installed or maintained instrumentation. The reality is that in modern day labs with modern day equipment, electrical hazards aren't statistically all that common as long as the instrumentation is used per the manufacturer's specifications. Now, that being said, there are certain instruments, there is certain equipment out there that may present usage hazards, such as pretty much anything with electrodes in it. Other sources of electrical hazards could be loose or frank power connections, damaged power lines and cables, disassembled instrumentation that's being repaired, there are, of course, other possibilities as well. If you ever see a lockout, tagout tag, respect it. Uh, don't bypass any locks or maintenance items that your maintenance folks or engineers have installed. Obviously, don't go looking for trouble. Uh, I mean, there's really no point to it, please. Chemical hazards, uh, these are quite common. And keep in mind, I am including biological hazards here. Now, chemical and biological safety must be practiced without exception. Please do not take shortcuts. I know it is tempting, but this might be one of the top ways of getting hurt. 
Now, there are routes of chemical exposure. You could inhale it. You could inject yourself accidentally with it. You could spill it on yourself and absorb it. I'm sure there are other routes I've not even considered. So, a couple of chemical safety guidelines. Do not do what this fellow is doing. Do not eat or drink in lab space. Yes, it is tempting sometimes. You may go, hey, I'm careful. But don't. All it takes is sometimes a drop of a lethal chemical to fall in your water or coffee. Uh, and perhaps it doesn't manifest right away. It manifests years later. Please, unlike this person, use personal protection equipment, also known as PPE. Finally, organize your workspace. Do you see that it's a bit of a mess? There are pipette tips exposed, lots of things to just simply jab yourself or spill on yourself. So organization is key. If you're working, especially with anything toxic or biologically hazard, hazardous, uh, be careful that your workplace has been organized and laid out clearly so that you're not knocking over dangerous items. You may also wish to take a look at chemical safety information. This can come in many shapes and forms. One of the common ones is the NFPA or National Fire Protection Association Hazard ID System. These are tags are shown below that are usually placed near lab entrances for emergency professionals, although they can give you an idea of what to expect in the lab as well. Generally speaking, the hazard ID system evaluates flammability, health, reactivity from a score of one to four. Higher the score, worse the hazard. So take a look before you enter into any lab. Does it have an NFPA sticker? What does it say? That may determine the level of personal protection equipment that you need to use. Keep in mind that NFPA is not the only hazard ID system. Chemicals have additional hazard symbols, usually directly on the chemical. There are too many to go into, but usually they're quite self-explanatory. If you see something that looks explosive, if you see a giant hazard sign or a radioactive sign or a biological sign or a giant exclamation mark, you know something isn't right there. Take a moment to identify what the symbol means. Also, make it a point to become familiar with the material safety data sheet, called the MSTS or the STS for short. This document provides detailed information on chemical storage, hazards, disposal, medical treatment, and a lot more. It should really be provided to you with the purchase of every chemical. Now, I earnestly recommend if you receive a chemical that you're not comfortable with, that you've not worked with before in your particular setting or lab, Spend a minute, read the STS, because honestly, a minute reading this document might just save you a week in the hospital. I also want to provide you with some general, I repeat, general chemical storage guidelines. Organic solvents must be stored in a safety cabinet of some sort. These, can, these are, by nature, volatile. They can be explosive. They can be quite toxic if the fumes get released. So please store them in a safety cabinet, preferably one that's vented. Acids and bases must be stored away from these separately in a corrosives or equivalent cabinet. You usually don't want explosive organics and something with a high potential energy like an acid and a base being next to each other. Finally, gas tanks should be secured. There are many securing apparatus or items available on the market. But please, if you ever see a gas tank just lying around unsecured, that's an accident waiting to happen. All it takes is for the gas tank to tip over, for the nozzle to break, and you basically have a rocket that's been created. Now, some other guidelines, it's recommended that you organize your salts, your buffers, your standards, and your other reagents. There's no need to just leave them lying around everywhere. Find some way of storing these things. Find some mechanism to quickly identify and target your reagent or standard. Keep in mind that refrigeration or perhaps special storage requirements may be required. Perhaps your chemicals have to be purged with nitrogen before they're stored. This information is usually found on the bottle, almost always in the MSTS. Additionally, pay attention to chemical waste disposal guidelines. Keep in mind, your lab very likely has additional guidelines on what I provided here. 
but generally speaking, don't mix organic and aqueous solutions. They should be disposed separately. They should be disposed in their own containers. Use appropriate disposal containers. Be careful what you're using. If you're trying to throw any random organic into a light plastic container, well, it could dissolve the container and go leaking everywhere. This will take a little bit of research. You may wish to spend some time again on the MSTS or on the internet or with a chemical safety officer to identify whether your disposal equipment is suited for the task. Keep in mind that sometimes for certain chemicals, pretreatment may be required. For instance, hydrofluoric acid usually has to be neutralized before it's disposed. Finally, do not dispose hazardous chemicals down the drain. I know it's tempting, do not do it. There are a lot of health, environmental, and regulatory issues that are being raised. Your lab may provide you with guidelines regarding disposing salts, sometimes even acids down the drain, but this is on a lab by lab basis. Odds are you have some sort of a purification system on the outside of your lab or downstream, so to speak. But when in doubt, do not throw chemicals down the drain, period. Now let's have a chat about personal protection equipment, also called PPE. I'm sure this is known by other names, but this is what we're calling it today. This is often the first and most important line of defense. And I know sometimes it doesn't cover all of you, but just bear with me. Now, at very, very base or minimum levels, you need appropriate eye protection. You need appropriate gloves and a lab coat to have a base level of PPE protection. Keep in mind that additional PPE might be needed based on the type of analysis you're conducting type of instrumentation you're using, or the types of samples you're working with. These guidelines are usually defined in the instrument methodology, sample preparation metho methodology, or protocols. Some examples of additional PPE usage would be using arm sleeves, for instance, to prevent your arms from getting injured or from debris from your arms falling into your sample. Double gloving, especially when using toxic substances such as HF, is quite common as well. This is quite literally putting a glove on top of a glove. If you're working in a high dust or bacterial or antibiotic environment, you might need a mask and respirator, as shown on the right-hand side. You might even need full body protection if you're going out there to do field work occasionally. Finally, if you're in the semiconductor environment, odds are you will need what's called a bunny suit. This is a full body suit as shown on the image on the right hand side, the lady holding the volumetric flask with suspiciously strange liquid in it. Uh, let's talk a bit more about the types of gloves you may find out there. One of the most common gloves are nitrile gloves. They're made of, well, nitrile. And they're resistant to most chemical and biological hazards. They're quite strong. They're resistant to piercing or being cut open. But the issue is that they tend to be a little more pricier. That being said, I would argue that these are currently the most commonly used gloves in a lab environment. You can also find latex gloves. Now, latex gloves are, in a way, the predecessor to nitrile gloves. They are resistant to mm, aqueous chemical and biological hazards, but they don't do so well, generally speaking, with organics. They do have high tactile sensitivity, so you can grip things a bit better than nitrile. But the issue again is they are not resistant to most organic solvents and well, latex allergies seem to be growing. So you may be allergic to this type of glove. You may also find vinyl gloves. Now, these are really meant for low risk, non-hazardous type analysis. It's rarely found in a lab environment, honestly more in a medical environment. They're cheap and that's about it. That's really their only strength. In terms of cons, they don't offer a significant level of protection from organic or non-organic solvents. They are tend to be powdered. In fact, most gloves tend to be powdered and uh, they tend to be quite loose. So you don't get a whole lot of tactile sensitivity. Now, keep in mind, these are only three commonly used gloves. Nitrile, again, being arguably the most common one, but 
depending upon your analysis, you may need powder-free gloves. You may need trace metal gloves. You may need gloves that are heat resistant, that are designed to go into muffle furnaces to allow you to extract crucibles. You may need rubber gloves because nothing else is working. So please investigate your glove requirements prior to commencing analysis. Talk a little bit about emergency protocols, or at least how I like saying it, how do I control or deal with exposure to hazards? Now, before you start conducting any analysis, especially in a commercial lab, you usually need to establish a chemical safety and hygiene plan before you start analysis. This may require approval from a regulatory authority, from your chemical safety manager if you have one, from your academic institution, but this can take some time. Please also, if you're just starting your analysis, familiar, familiarize yourself with your method, with your protocol before commencing analysis. Remember to read your SOPs or your protocols. Remember to review the MSDS if you're working with unfamiliar chemicals. You may wish to have a chat with a health and safety officer if you're a little lost, or with your lab manager. After that, identify your emergency stations. Now, most labs will have, or at least need to have, an eye wash station, a lab shower, they may have a fire blanket or an extinguisher, uh, one of the two, and a first aid station. An eye wash station, as the name suggests, is out there to help you remove debris from your eyes. This can come as a high-end complicated uh, wash station, such as the one shown in the image below. It can be more basic, standalone. It can simply be sometimes be a bottle of liquid that's used to neutralize chemicals in your eye. A lab shower is used when, well, your entire body or a significant amount of your body has been exposed to a hazard or a chemical. Now, if this happens, please, this is not the time to be modest. Uh, you need to get in the shower, turn it on. You will make a mess. There's no way around it. Remove your clothes and affected items and uh, rinse yourself off. Next, you have your fire blanket and, and or extinguisher. Uh, some labs have both of these, but these are used to, as the name suggests, put out a fire. Finally, figure out where your first aid station is. Now, this could be a actual nurse's clinic. It could be a coronary lab. It could be a first aid kit that's snuck away inside a drawer. But please identify this before starting analysis. You don't want to cut yourself and be bleeding all over the place before you figure out there's no Band-Aid. Also keep in mind, stations should be visible and clearly labeled. This should be quite evident. Stations should be maintained. A lot of these items need to be on a half yearly, sometimes monthly, sometimes annual basis, checked for operation, checked for performance. This could sometimes be done in lab, but usually need to hire a professional. The third point is extremely important. Do not impede access to these stations. Don't put boxes, don't put pipette tips, don't crowd anywhere around these emergency stations. You should be able to get to them easily from any part of your lab. So again, no boxes, no nothing. These stations save free. Finally, remember that your analysis type may require additional safety protocols. Perhaps you require special hoods. Perhaps you require special exhaust systems. So again, consult with your health and safety manager, your lab manager, or your method to identify what more you need. So in summary, identify and evaluate your lab hazards. This doesn't take long. Please understand your safety documentation. Understand it is there to protect you. It may come in many shapes and forms. Be somewhat familiar with what's happening and exercise caution when working with something you haven't worked with before. Finally, establish and understand your safety protocols. Don't just randomly put them out there. Make sure they work. And finally, don't do what the guy in the picture is doing. Please, come on, just don't.